Hello, good afternoon. It's uh, November 11th. It's Armistice Day. The First World War finished 102 years ago today. It's a very, very strange Armistice Day, though, because we're in the middle of lockdown, strange times. Um, there's no public services. One this morning, Westminster Abbey, uh, no public commemoration. So let's have a local commemoration of what the first wars meant for Jericho and to North Oxford. We're very fortunate today to have uh, Council Liz Wade, who is not only a, a council, but is also a local historian, has written a very, very good book, or edited a very, very good book called 47 Men, and, and, and a novel called At the Going Down of the Sun. She's going to guide us through um, the First World War and, and men, men of North Oxford. Over to you, Liz. Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me, everybody? I hope so. Yes, we can. Um, yeah, I thought I'd start with with one photograph, which is the poster, um, which is up on the screen now. Uh, we put that up because we realised that the War Memorial at the end of St Margaret's Road was in a very bad way. It was 100 years old. And so I wanted to raise money so we could renovate it. And what we did was to produce this poster, which is a standard picture from the, from the Great War, but we put the names of all the 47 men on it because we wanted them to be remembered as individuals. They're not just the war memorial, they are people. And that's very important. Um, it was important throughout the work that, that we did in order to repair the war memorial and to tell their individual stories, which are in the book, as John says. Um, I wanted to talk a bit about Jericho and the reason why men were keen to go to war, because they were very keen. 750,000 men signed up in the first couple of months after war had been declared in August, in August 1918. Um, so, Jericho, what was it like in those days? Well, since the middle of the 19th century, it had begun to fill up with people, and that's because the canal arrived in 1790, and I think you can date it from then. And after the canal, we had the railways, we had the St. Herb's gas works, and in Jer Jericho particularly, we had the Oxford University Press, which until the Second World War employed about half the men in Jericho, believe it or not. And we also, of course, had Lu Lucy's, Iron and Brass Foundry became Lucy's Eagle Works in due course. So it was a very busy place and people came in from the country where there wasn't so much work but where there were big families because this industrial revolution that we saw in Jericho was partly due to the fact of the explosion of big families and the lack of agricultural work for people because of enclosures and so on. So they're all living in Jericho, okay? Then in the 1860s, there was another explosion in Jericho. Um, this, was the, this was the building of the red brick suburb, which became North Oxford, right on the doorstep of Jericho. It was built by St John's on their estate, and it had an extraordinary effect because it introduced a whole lot of middle-class people who hadn't lived in Oxford at all before on the whole. These were people who'd been in the Indian Army and in the Indian Civil Service, retirees, widows, people with large families, quite a lot of them dons, I suppose. Um, although the story that as soon as dons were free to remarry, the houses of North Oxford filled up with their families isn't true. But what was true was that these new houses, which were, which were all speculative buildings, filled up very fast and that provided work for the women for the first time. So the women of Jericho found themselves with jobs. They could be cooks, they could be domestic servants, it wasn't just the men bringing in the money, it was the women as well. And that changed Jericho. And things got better and better financially, despite the poor drainage and everything else that, uh, 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 that went with Jericho. Um, and then we have the pre-war years, and then there was even more development. And because Jericho people had more money in their pockets, I think an important landmark was the creation of the Phoenix Cinema, as it's now known. It was originally called the North Oxford Cinema, and it, it was opened in March 1913, and it brought a whole lease of life for people. They could go out in the evenings with their girlfriends. They could go somewhere. You couldn't take a nice girl to a pub, but you could take her to the cinema, and that was splendid. And this was quite a very special cinema. It had a commissioner in a uniform, it had a booth selling expensive chocolates inside. There was a musical soda fountain. And behind that, there was a lounge 
in which you could stand and talk to people while you waited for the film to start. It had long red velvet curtains and it had potted palms. And then you went in and you saw eight films in a row. And my theory, I don't know if anybody else goes along with it, but my theory is that because people's eyes were open to a world beyond Jericho, beyond Oxford, by the cinema as much as anything, that when the call to war came, people were excited by the prospect of going somewhere different, actually being somewhere different, not just seeing it on cinema screens, but actually going there themselves. So that's my theory about why people volunteered so quickly from Jericho as they did. In no time at all, they were queuing up at the Wild Beast Museum in St Giles, which subsequently became part of the Oxford Playhouse. And it's now a language school next to the St Giles Parish rooms. You'll know it, it's that red brick building, which is rather anonymous, but that was the Wild Beast Museum. I presume they pushed the wild beasts back against the wall and use it as their recruiting station. But so this is the world that they came from in order to join up. And so this slide we've got here is the Robinson family. And the man on the extreme right of your screens in the second row is Nathaniel Robinson. He joined up late. He wasn't a risk taker, was Nathaniel. He was still living with his parents at the age of 41. He was still a porter. He wasn't really going anywhere. So I suspect that, that it was only after conscription started in 1917 that he joined up. But sadly, he was killed on the first day of the 19 spring offensive, which is when the Germans under Ludendorff attempted to recapture the initiative on the Western Front. And sadly, Nathaniel Robinson was one of the one of the casualties of that particular offensive. So next slide, please. Uh, this isn't a very good slide, but it's the best we've got. This is May Day at Falun Gym School, which is where most of the boys and girls in the area went. The girls were moved off to another school at an early age, I think seven or eight years old, but the boys stayed. And if they were lucky, they stayed until they were 14, although many of them left at 13 to go to jobs as errand boys and uh, other apprenticeships. Uh, life started early in those days. So that was the May Day celebration. And that came from Arthur Morris's family. He's one of the men on the war memorial. And he's he may be one of the boys in this picture, but we don't know anymore. Next slide, please. Um, this is the Colmer wedding. On the left in the middle is Albert Colmer, who is one of our men. Again, somebody who went reluctantly to war. This is a joint wedding. This is him and his sister, and it's a joint wedding. Um, Albert's next to his uh, bride, Bessie, and next to her is Ida, who is Albert's sister, and next to Ida is her husband, George Mitchell. So it was a joint wedding at St Margaret's Church, and that was in... Nine, uh, in 1914, Albert wasn't going to war. He was very happy being at home with his new wife. But um, he finally had to go to war. He had no choice and he um, and he didn't survive very long, sadly, leaving behind a two-year-old child. Next slide, please. Then we've got Lionel Edens. Lionel Edens is another of our men from Kingston Road. He was... Um, a solicitor's clerk, not an article clerk, but a solicitor's clerk. Maybe he had hopes of other things. He'd been to Oxford Boys' School, which was a step up from most of the people who'd been to Phil and Jim. They mostly went straight into work, but Lionel didn't. Um, and the picture on the left of your screen is Lionel as a small child. He must have been about six or seven then. And that's his sister and a nurse. And I have no idea what this picture shows, but I think it's rather delightful. It's a world that's vanished, really. Um, there are a whole lot of glass bottles, so it looks rather medical, but in the back there's a fireplace. So this may be that, that the little girl who became Sylvia Johnson, who only died very recently, she still lived in this area. Maybe the little girl was ill and needed special treatment at home. I don't know. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, I'm showing you this slide because it's the Lambert's boot and shoe shops. Lambert's had two shops in St Giles. You can just see them in the picture. The one sort of in the middle is number 73 and number 70 is a couple of doors down and the Lambert family owned them both. Um, this engraving was made in um, 1912 
So it's pretty much the way that it would have looked when our men went to war. Um, Cyril Lambert was on our memorial. He was killed and so was his older brother. Their third brother survived, but he was badly gassed and never really came round after the war. Um, next slide, please. This is a picture of the Bridesons. Um, this is the whole Brideson family at the back, are mother and father. Then there's Charles Brideson, who is a professional soldier who came back from India to fight on the Western Front. Then there are the three sisters. And then there's John Brideson, and below him is the youngest Brideson boy. And I'm showing you this slide because, sadly, Charles and John both both died on the Western Front, but the Brideson family did a rather extraordinary film, a, a rather extraordinary thing. Could you show the next slide, please? Right, if you can see this slide, maybe not very clear to you, but this is actually John Brideson. Um, after their two sons had died, the family put up a memorial window in St Margaret's Church, and you can see it there every Sunday. And there is John Brideson with a photograph taken of him, a photograph which I have a copy of, showing him as St Alban, and he is there forever, or until the window collapses. It just seems a very extraordinary thing to us, but maybe at the time it was a more acceptable thing to do. Next slide, please. Right, this is the Scala Cinema. Well, in those days, when it was first set up, it was the North Oxford Kinema. Then it became the Scala, and this is it. In its early days, this is in May 1913, you can see the commissioner, you can see the various films on the board next to him that people are going to see. It was a long bill, but the films were all quite short. Uh, matinee that day, and then over on the left-hand side is the chocolate booth, which I put into my novel because I think it's so extraordinary, really, in a world where life was really quite hard in a lot of ways. But if you went to the North Oxford Kinema, then you had a bit of the good life. And the next one, please. Next slide, please. Um, this is the final slide, which I put in just because I like it, really. It's a bit later in that it was made either in 1935 or 1936. But I think it's Jericho, as our men would have known it. And it's, an, it's a special photograph, actually. It was taken by a refugee from Hitler's Germany, um, Hungarian actually, called Laszlo Molinagy. And he was he came over here, he was befriended by John Betjeman, and he did a whole lot of extraordinary photographs, extraordinary for their time, for a book that John Betjeman wrote about Oxford. It's not a very good book, but these photographs that that uh, that Laszlo did are pretty special. And I just like this one. Partly the dog, of course, but the whole idea of the, of the bleakness of life. And you can understand why people would think, maybe we'd like to get away, maybe we'll do something different, we'll go to the Western Front. If we don't go quickly, then we're going to miss the war. And then the girls will say, what did you do in the war? And we'll be given white feathers. Um, there was a huge push on people to take the King's shilling and uh, to go out to the Western Front, and they did in huge numbers. So that's the opening of the presentation. Later on, I might tell you about some of the individual men a bit more, but this is for starters. Okay. Okay, th th thank you very much, Liz. So um, the 47 men in that memorial, how many of them were Jericho? How many of them were North Oxford? Well, how does it divide up? It's, it's complicated because people move around a lot in those days. People rented. Nobody seemed to own... Oh, you know, are the very rich own their houses, but the kind of people who are living in uh, Jericho and in Kingston Road and Hayfield Road would rent, and so they'd move. So you get people who'd be in Jackson Street one year and Plantation Road the next, and then Kingston Road the next. It was partly uh, the result of actually doing better in life, but there were often such large families that nobody actually did very much better. They would have done better had they only had two children, but most of them seemed to manage nine or 11, and so they were living in comparatively small houses. Um, so to say which were Jericho people is, is a difficult one. Probably about seven or eight of them were really Jericho men. The rest are spread out in Kingston, 
and in Hayfield. Um, Twelve of the men on the War Memorial um, are from Hayfield Road, so 12 out of 47, which is a huge number. Um, and I, I can tell you a story about that if you'd like me to. Would you like me to tell you a story? Please. <laughs> okay, right. This is a story from a lady called Madeline Morris Penn, who is the who is the great niece of a man called Arthur Morris, whom I'll show you a photograph of later. And she heard this story from her aunt, Elsie, who lived in Hayfield Road. And Elsie told this story, which was that when the postman came to the road with the telegram, and it was very obviously a telegram, they were very thin and they came in pale yellow envelopes. And he would hold it in his hand and walk slowly down the road and the women would come out on the doorstep and they would wait and see where he would stop, praying, I suppose, it wouldn't be their house. And then when he reached the house and knocked on the door, they would rush out and they would go to that house and wait for the woman to come out. And so there was a tremendous amount of community support because so many of them were experiencing either the same fear or indeed the same loss. And so it was that's a like a, a yeah. national lottery, a national lottery where you were winning death. Yes, yes, yes. Um, it was it it was twelve houses out of the house, all the houses in the road. So it was a, it was a lot of death, and everybody knew everybody, of course. Um, so it was a very terrible thing. But but it was the germ that actually started me writing the novel. I thought this is such an extraordinary story. I have to write it, um, and so the novel came out of that really, out of that one story. Uh, uh, which which of the families suffered most? Have you come across family in which half of the men died or more than that? No, I, I haven't. I haven't found that. Um, often two sons would die, but this is often from a family of nine or ten sons, with nine or ten children, and so it's difficult to know. It's difficult to know at a time when we have so few children in comparison whether the loss of one or two children would be as major as it is now? I think it probably was, because, because one of the things I know about Aunt Elsie, who is Arthur's younger sister, was that one of the few things that she left behind when she died was a little reticule. And in the reticule was the telegram about Arthur and some photographs of him and a thing called the Dead Man's Penny, which I'll talk about later. So, so for her, anyhow, um, uh, his death was one of the major events in her life. And so, although it, although I'm tempted to say that if you have 10 children, you can afford to lose two for king and country. Uh, I, think well, that's, well, why, I think that's... Why did they sign up? I mean, they, they were recruited, some of them, at the Scala Cinema. You know, why, what, what, what were the push and the pause of signing up for the, for the, world, for the First World War? Uh, uh, for most of them, earn very little. They were earning well at the at, at um, OUP or at Lucy's, um, and so it was an odd thing to do. Um, Lionel Edens, who I've just mentioned, the one with the picture of his sister and the nurse, was was a solicitor's clerk. These were people who had futures in Oxford. Um, why did they do it? I, th I think they did it because there was such a tremendous push. There was a, a man called, I called Horatio Bottomley, who was later found to be a terrible fraudster. But in the early months of the war, he went round the country doing these huge speeches about king and country. And people were not as cynical then as we are now. And they went for it. And they thought, we have to go quickly because this is going to be a short war. It'll be over by Christmas, to coin a phrase. I think that must have been one of his phrases. Um, and, uh, and and we need to be part of it. This is our chance to have a bit of excitement in lives that otherwise stretch out in, often in basic drudgery for so many. Uh, so I think that's really the joint individual stories, aren't you, of so many people? Over, over to yes, you. Yes, Oh, right, okay, you'd like me to do that? Okay, fine. Um, right, so, so we have got to, um, if we can go, yes, we've got to the dog. Um, this is the next slide. This is what happened when you joined off. It was all very exciting at the World Beast Museum and the Scala Cinema. But when you actually got to the camp, and this was a camp which was photographed in 1917, this is 
was at Sand Hill near Weymouth. Weymouth is where a lot of our men, particularly in the Ox and Bucks, went to France from in uh, cattle boats, actually, which always struck me as rather rather unfortunate. But these men are quite fortunate because they've got uniforms and they might even have guns. Most of the men in these training camps only had bits of uniforms and they were using sticks rather than guns. And some of them took their sticks as well as their guns with them to the Western Front because they got fond of them and used to them. Um, so that's the training camp. That's when the harsh reality of life on the Western Front begins to uh, begins to um, come home to people. Uh, next slide, please. Right, um, this is the Western Front. It's 440 miles. It stretches from the North Sea coast right down to Switzerland. Um, a bit of it was around Ypres and around the Somme, um, both names which I think still reverberate for people. The French held the lower part around Verdun, which is also a name that reverberates particularly in France. So that was what they were going to do. They were going to hold the line. Kitchener was fairly contemptuous of these troops. He called them ragtag and bobtail troops, these men from Jericho and other places, because he didn't consider them proper soldiers. And so he decided the safest thing was a war of attrition. He'd get them to dig. They'd sit in their trenches. And after a bit, we would win because there would be more of us than there would be of them. It was fairly basic, really. So that was the strategy. Um, next slide, please. Then there is the reality of the Western Front when they get there. This is a German photograph. Uh, German photographs are often sadder than ours, um, but I've, I've put this one in because it's got a crucifix, a Calvary in it. And that's interesting because we hadn't had Calvaries in this country. Uh, England as a Protestant country didn't really go in for it. But there were calvaries like this all over the Western Front, and men remembered them. And when, when the war was over, a lot of the memorials were shaped either as crosses or indeed as whole calvaries. Um, and that, I think, is the, is, the, uh, is, the, is the result of men's experiences on the Western Front. It was an absolutely grim place, and you will all know the photographs of the broken trees and the, and the shell and the shell hills filled with stagnant water. That was that was what they had to fight through. Uh, okay, next slide, please. Right, I'm just going to show you very quickly some of the men. Um, I think the point I want to make about these men, because I haven't got time to show you them all. So I'll show you half dozen very quickly and four in a bit more detail. This is Percy Campbell. Uh, Percy Campbell um, arrived in Flanders just after the Battle of Mons, just when the retreat from Mons was taking place. He survived 19 days. Um, he did his best all the time. When they were in, uh, in Ostend, uh, he, uh, he brought his men a lot of chocolate. And he says in his letters at the time, which we've got, um, I knew that what they really wanted was drink, but I wanted them to be as fit as possible when they reached the front. <laughs> and so he bought them chocolate instead and hoped that would satisfy them. I doubt if it did, but, but anyhow, um, he didn't survive to become unfit himself. Although in the novel I wrote, he does because I couldn't bear to finish him off in the end. So that's Percy. The next one, please, is, um, yeah, uh, this is Gordon, uh, this is Gordon Jelf. He was um, a correspondent for the Times in Berlin when the war broke out. He came back very quickly. He didn't have to go to war, but he joined up immediately. And he died. He was 19 when he died. And the thing about these men is that they all look much older than men of 1920 do these days. Um, so that's Gordon. And then the next one, please. Um, right. This is Ronald Saxon. He was a young man who was just going up to one of the colleges. Um, Worcester College, I think it was. He was going to take holy orders, but instead... When the war broke, he joined up immediately, and at the age of 20, he was killed again on the Western Front. Next slide, please. This is Raymond Drew, and I've put Raymond in because four of the men who are on the war memorial were men who came back from abroad to answer the call, which was put out to Empire for men to come back, and four of them did. Drew was one of them. He was he was running. Um, a teak robber firm in Burma, but he came back immediately. Um, 
fought in various theatres of war, finally uh, older than the others. He was 33 when he finally died, but there were three other men like him. There was Charles Castle, who was a man of Jericho, who was illegitimate, had a rough life, I think, as a child, ended up working in a flower shop and then decided when he got married that he'd go to Canada and find a new life, but he came back and joined up and his wife and child came back with him and she was, of course, widowed when he died. Then there's um, G, who went to be a farmer in Queensland from, uh, from North Oxford, came back, was killed. And finally, um, a chap called Kenneth Morland, who was a tea planter in Salon, but also came back. And I do find that extraordinary that the pull of the, of the mother country was so strong that they were prepared to do that. Could I have the next slide, please? Um, this is Harry Gibson, who fought at, at Tiger Lively, which is this awful barren peninsula. Uh, the, the idea was to distract the, the Ottoman Empire and maybe the German effort from what was happening on the Western Front, which was a bit of a disaster. Gallipoli, as we all know, is a total failure. And but um, Harry Gibson survived only to go via Egypt and the Sinai, um, fighting the Turks in, in uh, Palestine, was finally killed um, very bravely, taking on an entire Turkish platoon in, in uh, Gaza, and that's where he's buried. He is described as an ardent member of the Oxford Alpine Club, and he does rather look that way, doesn't he? Um, next slide, please. And finally, we've got Herbert Emmett. Herbert, Hermit, Herbert, sorry, Herbert Emmett, it's hard to say. Um, we have got the memoirs of Herbert Emmett as we have Percy Campbell and Gordon Jelf, and that's huge really because we've got their letters and what other people said about them. Um, Herbert Emmett, talking about his time in the trenches, um, he was 26 when he died, so he's a bit older than some of these chaps have said. My duties are divided between a provider of variety entertainment and a business manager out of the trenches and a chief foreman of works when we were in. Herbert talked with pride about his men, as all these subalterns, that's the young commissioned officers do, keeping the hardships from those at home by writing the most amazingly, doggedly cheerful letters you have ever read. Because as, a, as an officer, he would, have to, he would have to read all the letters and scratch out anything he thought inappropriate. Um, he was killed on 14th of July, 1916, as part of the Somme Offensive. Um, like 21 of the 47 men on the war memorial, he has no known grave. He is remembered on the Teepfel Memorial, as so many of them are. Um, next slide, please. Right, so this is Arthur Morris. Um, Arthur Morris is one of my favourite people because I've met Madeleine Morris and some other members of the family, so I feel I almost know him. Um, what can I say about Arthur Morris? Um, I can say that as a child, he was sickly. His mother died when he was eight, but it was a huge family. He, had, he was the ninth of 18 children, 11 of whom survived infancy. And he had several older sisters who looked after him. And he was treated with enormous care. Um, he always had to have the place nearest the hearth. And one of the phrases that his younger sister Elsie remembers is, save that last bit for Arthur. He was always being looked after. Anyhow, um, just before he was due to go out to France, he had appendicitis and he was taken to the Radcliffe Infirmary and was operated on. Um, normally in those days, because there, were no, um, uh, there was no penicillin, it was a long convalescence after an appendicectomy, but no, instead of the convalescence, he was sent out to the Western Front and one of his brothers wrote after Arthur's death, it makes me nearly, nearly choked to think about the way he was treated, for he was never fit for active service, and it's a wonder he stuck it as well as he did. I think everyone who knew him felt sorry he had to join up. You all should be proud of a lad like him, doing his bit without a lot of grumbling. And then this is a letter in April 1918, as Arthur wrote to Elsie. Just a few lines to let you know I'm getting on all right out here. Sorry I did not write before. 
We had a nice voyage on the sea. It was very calm and it didn't take long to get here. He actually arrived in time just for the desperate spring offensive of March to July 1918. Um, he'd been in France for less than three weeks when he suffered a severe shrapnel wound and he died in a casualty clearing station. Um, he was 20 years old. He was one of 420,000 British soldiers who died during the spring offensive. His two older brothers, Charlie and Frank, both survived the war. Charlie wrote in May 1918, what a thing luck is. There's Frank been out all the time and not a scratch, and Arthur only a few weeks. Frank has been doing something great by all accounts, but will he get the reward? Pleased to say I'm keeping in the pink, but shall be glad when it's over. After the war, both brothers became greengrocers. Frank had a shop in North Parade and Charlie in Summertime Parade. So they both survived and they did well. So that's Arthur. Next slide, please. Uh, and that is the, that's the telegram. I mentioned the telegram earlier. And that was how you found out that your son or your brother or your husband had died, as basic as that. Although for Arthur, and probably for quite a lot of men, there were letters which were sent by their officers and by their friends. And in the memoirs we've got, which I think I should put on the website, actually, um, I, th I think they're worth reading, some of them. Okay, so that's the that's Arthur's telegram. Next slide, please. Um, and then we've got Norman Smith. Uh, Norman Smith is wearing a big white thing over his army uniform, and that thing is actually a sheepskin, and that that means that Norman must have been back on leave because. What soldiers found when they were on the Western Front in the autumn and winter was it was absolutely freezing. And so they all bought sheepskins when they got home and they went back wearing them. And it was a sign that you knew what you were doing and you were in charge of your life to some extent. So this is Norman. Um, Norman um, had worked at Lucy and Co. He was, um, I have to get this right, he was an engineer's pattern maker. So he had a good job, but... He couldn't be certain, like all these men, that his job would still be open for him when he got back. That was one of the dangers of going to war, was that nobody would promise you your job. Um, anyhow, he served as a sergeant, so a non-commissioned officer, and he fought in the Battle of the Somme, which opened on the 1st of July. This is remembered as the bloodiest day in the history of the British Army, and that's still the case. Um, nobody knows how many men were killed, but something like 19,000 and 35,000 wounded just on the first day. It continued until the 18th of November and was astonishingly unsuccessful. He was 21 years old when he died and he's remembered on the St Margaret's War Memorial. His parents, Robert and Grace, lived on at 55 Kingston Road and died there in the 1950s in their 85th year. So that is normal. And then, if we can move on to the next slide. This is Stuart Payne. Stuart is one of two brothers, Stuart and Charles. Um, they lived at 78 Kingston Road. And Stuart's father was a dairyman. And Stuart, in the 1911 census, which is the most up-to-date one we had before the war, was a college servant. He was 15 then. Um, he was still living at 78 Kingston Road with his parents. Um, he served in the Ox Oxford and Buckinghamshire Light Infantry, as so many of them did, and he was killed in action in France at the age of 23. Um, he's remembered on the Roll of Honour at Christchurch, and I think that's rather nice. Um, not, all, not all the colleges included the servants on the Rolls of Honour, but Christchurch did. So Stuart Payne is there and you can see his name if you if you go there. It's just inside the entrance to the cathedral. Stuart's older brother Charles, who was 28, died of wounds in France just 13 days later in October 1918. So that would still have been, um, that would have been part of the same, of the same offensive. So, right. And then finally, but not finally, is Ronald Bright. 
And if you can move on to the next slide, please. Ronald Bright, here we are. Um, Ronald Bright. Um, he went to Oxford High School for Boys, where he was a corporation scholar. I don't know what that means, but he was the eighth of nine children. And so probably his start in life was quite inauspicious until he got his scholarship. Then he left school at 14. He was apprenticed to electrical engineers and he joined up underage. And a lot of people did this. There's a story, it was an urban myth at the time, that a boy would come to the front of the queue and the recruiting sergeant would say, and how old are you, son? And he would give his correct age. And the sergeant would say, go, go to the back of, of the queue and come back when you're 19. And possibly Ronald Bright did this. In 1914, you had to be 19 to join up. The ages of between 19 and 30. By 1918, it was between 18 and 51. And the height had gone down from five foot six at the beginning to five foot at the end. So anyhow, Ronald Bright joined up underage. He did very well. By the time he was 18, he was a lieutenant in, in a fighter squadron of the Royal Flying Corps, which later became the RAF. And this isn't his plane, but I do have a picture of him in his plane, um, which I hadn't got at the time that I, I did this slide, slide uh, show for you. Um, he died in his plane over Menin in Belgium. Um, in, when did he die? In May, in May 1918, which was quite late on in the war, um, I thought I'd read you a bit of the letter that he wrote. This is one of his last letters. This was in April 1918. Dear Beat, this is to one of his sisters. Thank you so much for letter and birthday wishes. Also, please thank Nobby very much for the photo. I like it very much. And the little black cat I always wear. The squadron is getting on very well. We've got nine Huns down up to the present and have lost one man, unfortunately. We are very comfortable. The only thing is we get air raids on fine nights and are sometimes kept awake by guns and shells, but everybody is jolly cheerful out here. Tell Mrs. Coleman not to, not to worry too much about Reg. It is pretty rotten, we all know, but everybody I've seen takes things as they come and keeps smiling. In fact, soldiers out here are much more cheerful than those at home. So I think that appears to the statement that Emmett made later, that the soldiers were very cheerful when they wrote their letters home. So that's Ronald Bright. Can, can we move on to the final slide or two? That would be good. Um, and those are the medals that you could win. They were called Pip, Squeak and Wilfred. The one in the middle is the important one. That's Pip. That was otherwise known as the Monstar, and you could only get that if you'd fought it, if you'd fought between 5th August 1918 and December 1918. The others are service medals which went to men of Britain and men of the empire. Um, these are the medals of Percy Campbell. And then onto the next slide. And this is the one that I want your help with people. If there's anybody out there, um, I would really like your help with this. This is a thing called a dead man's penny. Um, a dead man's penny was a bronze medal which was given to the families of men who had died. Um, just want to get some information about that. Yep. One million three hundred and fifty five thousand of them were issued to next of kin of all British and Empire servicemen up until the nineteen thirties. Um this is probably quite an early one. But later on, they were made at the Royal Arsenal in Woolwich. Um, but this is, this is particularly curious because it's for Frank White, and Frank White is our unknown soldier. Um, we worked hard trying to find out who Frank White was. And Stephanie Jenkins, who is this extraordinary local historian who's, who did a great deal of work on the Men on Our War Memorial, found 67 Frank Whites killed in World War I, but only one had um, had any connection at all with Oxford, and, and we, we we really didn't think that he was that he was our man. He certainly had no connection with our bit of Oxford, so we were rather stuck. We came up with a chap called Bernard White, 
And he seemed to work quite well because he lived in Jackson Street. And so in the book, 47 Men, we put him in with a great big query next to him. Bernard White, is he the man? But we are very doubtful. Um, Stephanie Jenkins came up with a third idea, which was that maybe Frank White was gassed and survived in hospital in Oxford to just beyond the cutoff date for being recognised by the Commonwealth War Graves Commission as war dead. So it wouldn't be on their war dead uh, database. And that might be the case. But anyhow, uh, to tell you a final story, I was walking down the high, which is not usual for me. And I looked in at the window of Antiques on High, which is extremely unusual for me. And there in the window, along with a whole lot of other great war memorabilia, was this dead man's penny. And on it was the name Frank White. So the shop was closed, but I rushed back the following morning before anybody bought it to find out something about it. Unfortunately, the storeholder couldn't help me. He couldn't tell me anything. So I now have Frank White's Dead Man's Penny, which is a thing that I am very proud to have, but it will go along with all the other stuff. Can you see it? I hope you can see it. It will go with all the other stuff to the, to, uh, to the local history centre up at St Luke's. I think the time has come to put everything up there, the photographs and the information that we've got, so it will be accessible for a future generation. But in the meantime, if anybody can tell us who Frank White is, we would be absolutely thrilled. Um, so that's a job for anybody here who has access to the internet or access to any members of Frank White's descendants. Or how, do they get in touch with you? how do they get in touch with you? Uh, they get in touch with me. Um, we've got a website. Um, if it comes to the worst, they can find me on the council website, and I'm very happy for them to do that. But but we have a website, which is, is the Graffiti Press website, and that's on the final slide of all, um, which if we could go on to the final slide. Um, thank you. Um, that's on. Um, that's got the the name of the website, and any email going to that web, uh, anything going to that website will come through to me. Um, I, I mentioned these books. Uh, not just out of hubris, although I'm very proud of them, but really because all the profits, and I, I mean the profits, not just the proceeds, go, um, go. sorry, I mean the proceeds, not the profits. I've been talking for too long, John. Go to Combat Stress, which is a charity. It's the leading charity for helping veterans, service veterans of all the services who have experienced mental health problems, and, of course, like all charities, it's got problems at the moment. It's had to cut down on the work it's doing. If you were to buy the book from Blackwell's, it wouldn't be so good because Blackwell's inevitably take part of the proceeds. If you buy it from me, then all the money can go to combat stress. And I would be very grateful if you would consider doing that if you want to read a bit more about this. Um, there's also a website, which I should have put on the on the slideshow, but I failed to do so, but you'll be able to find it. It's the... It's the uh, it's the history website, and I will put it up on the Graffiti Press website so you can have access to it. And that's got longer stories about all the various men, all 47 of them. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say. You were so uh, moved by writing the, the story of these men. You actually wrote a novel uh, as a result. Do you, do you have that to hand? Would you maybe like to read us a short extract, perhaps a bit about the Scala Cinema and recruiting of the Scala Cinema? Right, okay. Uh, stop me if it goes on too long, okay? I will, um, don't worry. Is, <laughs> well, you know, time is of the essence. Right, um, this is Albert Phipps speaking. Albert Phipps is one of the men on the War Memorial, and in my, and, and my novel is told through the voices of, of the three men. He is one of them, Albert Phipps. This is what he says. The theatre of war, this is how it started for us at the Scala along Walton Street on a Saturday in August, two weeks into a piddling war in Belgium. Our brave boys seeing off the Hun. He'd be back in Germany soon with his tail between his legs. I was there with Maisie and, of course, with Norman, Arthur, Nat and the rest and their girls. We filled up a whole row. I was flush that night and wanted to impress, so instead of the usual bag of sweets, I'd got Maisie chocolates, rose and violet creams, four of each. She said they were her favourites, which made me nervous. They're dear, but not as dear as you, I said gallantly when she looked embarrassed by the price. It worried me, though, as a sign of things to come. 
I viewed Maisie as a long-term prospect, but not if she was going to bankrupt me. So then the film gets underway. It looks as though it's going to be a pretty standard evening, and then something happens. Then the projector ground to a halt, and a world-weary sigh passed down our row. It was time for the musical interlude. Our mums and dads liked it. For them, it was about the community's singing and musical turns of their homespun youth. For us, it was a bore that had to be endured while the projectionist drank his pint from the Jericho house and got organised for the second half. Then there was a blast of the British Grenadiers from Mr Tugwood on the piano and down the aisle marched an officer in full uniform. He took up his station at the centre of the screen, all his brass buckles and buttons gleaming. The effect was only a bit diminished by his having to squint against the spotlights. As the projectionist adjusted the lighting, he relaxed visibly, and so did we. We shouldn't have. Now then, lads, he barked. Having a good evening, are we? One or two shouted back. Yeah, we are. Until you came on, another added. The rest of us just sat there uncertain. What was to follow? Right then. What I want you to think about for five minutes, and he looked theatrically at his wristwatch. Just five minutes, and then your evening can start to roll again. Just for five minutes, I want you to think what you might be doing in a month's time. What's your job, lad? And now he was talking directly to a chap in the front row. Morning, boy, sir. The next chap mumbled something. Speak up, yelled the sergeant. Greengrocers was what came out. Sweeping up cabbage leaves. This time the contempt was palpable. And so, and so it went on. He dismissed everything we did. We sank lower in our seats, but knew that, as with our headmaster, there was no avoiding his scrutiny. Finally, he reached the end of our row. My turn. And you, son? I stood up. It doesn't matter what I do now. This time tomorrow, I'll have taken the king's shilling and I'll be in khaki. There was a hooray from the back row and the noise swelled. Everyone was stamping and cheering. People were clapping me on the back. Too hard, some of them. I felt myself being lifted up, carried to the front on the shoulders of friends and strangers and deposited next to the sergeant. Everyone was on their feet, clapping and hooting. The spotlights had been turned up high and I couldn't see anything. I was blinking like an owl in the glare, but I felt magnificent. Isolated there against the black velvet of the screen, I was already a hero. The sergeant turned to me and under the hubbub of noise said, well done, lad. Close to, I could see the lines on his face, the watchiness of his eyes. He was older than my dad and tired. Then his face tightened and he wheeled back to face the baying crowd in front of us. Who's going to keep this lad company then, he bellowed. There's enough of you here to make a pal's battalion, I'd say. Fighting together, shoulder to shoulder, you'll soon sort the hun out. And if you don't get out to the front soon, it'll all be over. You'll be sorry when the girls ask you, what did you do in the war? And you have to tell them you spent it sweeping up rotten veg. It'll be white feathers for you lot and kisses for this brave lad next to me. And he put his arms around my shoulder in a comradely way. Then the stampede began, men shouldering their way to the front. And so it goes on. Thank Fine. you. Thank you. I mean, that, that's, that's all been absolutely fascinating. Can we see the, the book slide again, please? So the people could take in. Uh, the, there are the two books, 47 Men and uh, Going Down on the Sun, both available from, from Liz. At, at, at that address there, um, pl please buy them. I've read them both, and they're both fascinating. Um, if uh, thank you so much, Liz. Um, uh, I, I hope you managed to find out the the, the mystery of of, of, the, of the of the penny. Now, now, just moving on. I mean, there was more than one war, of course. Uh, Britain's been involved in lots of wars, and um, there was a second war as well, Second World War, and and Jericho lived through that as well. Um, one of the people who who was only a kid then. But is now in his 80s was uh, David Barson. He lived in Cranham Terrace. And uh, now earlier on today, I caught up with him and asked him what he remembered about uh, Jericho in World War Two. First of all, David, tell me who are you and what's your connection to Jericho? David Barson, seven Cranham Terrace, Oxford, born in 1934, stayed there for 19 years. You were you were here during the Second World War, weren't you? What was it like? Yes. Very difficult for a youngster to remember. My father was in the rescue service um, uh, because he was ruptured and couldn't go back into the forces. Um, and I had a reasonably good childhood, but it was very much um, going down to the Fort Meadow 
and uh, amongst friends. We also were quite good churchgoers in those days at St Paul's Church in Oxford, where I was a server. My father was church warden. So, um, what happened if there was an air raid, for example, in Jericho? Well, in the other side of kind of kind of terrace, there was a blacksmith, come Cartwright. Uh, who um, was, was a big blacksmith's forge. His name was Mr. Humphrey. He had a very big house in in Cranham Street, and we were uh, taken over there to the uh, basement, where that was used for for our family as an air raid shelter. Do Do you remember rationing and things like that during that war? I was a little bit too young to remember it all. The main thing that that worried me was the sweet ration, and it was it was very small. And I always remember going to uh, to Little Clarendon Street. I was a Mrs. East with a sweet shop there, and we used to go on Sundays to the uh, University Parks. And when we came back, I uh, when we got some coupons, I was allowed to. Uh, buy some sweets in that shop and I always remember uh, going for Roundtree's fruit gums because they lasted longer. My during, during that time uh, my father made me a wooden Tommy gun uh, and he made a lot of, of toys for the Radcliffe Infirmary. What did your parents tell you about the war? That's a difficult one. I, the subject wasn't talked about very much. We had um, my my mother my, my mother had gone, but, but my my family had gone to live with my mother, which was in the St John's house off Seven Cranham Terrace, and we we also had a. Um, evacuee who I knew as Auntie Lottie and the, the subject of the war was not really talked about very much however are we uh, I was young old enough really to listen uh, and understand a bit that went on in on the radio and it, it was very difficult uh, because you, the parents didn't want to talk about it Rationing was very, very hard. How they managed, I don't know. But uh, I, I wasn't ever a cook. But, but I knew, I know very well that times were very, very difficult. Um, uh, and you had, used to have to queue up quite a lot. I can remember having to go to the butchers, co-op butchers, in um, Wharton Street. And I can still remember the, the number 18140, which was their co-op divvy number. Now, uh, let's last question. Let's get to the end of the war. What do you remember about the day in Jericho? Well, that's interesting. The opposite Tom's was the very big recreation ground. Whereupon, in one corner, there was swings, uh, a seesaw, etc., and the other was an open space, which we used for cricket and all kinds of things. On VE Day, particularly, there was a very big bonfire. Everybody brought all loads of rubbish, and it was a massive bonfire. And I, I, I remember some how, somehow how it happened. I don't know. They had fireworks, but they over over by Faulkner's on the in, a, in other words at the top against the wall. They built a stage, and there was music. Uh, I can remember a, a, an accordion player and, two, and and three or four people playing their hearts out. And they, they, um, they were dancing, a great deal of noise was made. And I can remember, I think it was the next day that we, we um, mum took, took, took over some potatoes and it, that they, they were put in the ashes. So I can remember having a hot, a, a hot potato out of it. But more than that, I can't, I can't remember it more. Okay, last question, Dave. Do, do you miss Jericho? Yes, I do. 
Um, the, the reason uh, pe there, were, there was a great deal of closeness, which I've never found before. People used to help each other a great deal. Everybody knew their next door neighbor and the, you, you got the lads to went to different schools that we all mixed together. Um, and people used to help each other out. In fact, I knew quite a few of the family names, even at my age. Um, it was a very close-knit community. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, he, Dave would like to get in touch with some of those people he knew way back when. He, 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 he was going to uh, write to Jericho online. He's going to write to me with some of the names. If you remember him, write to me. My email address is pretty well known. It's johnmayer100 at hotmail.com, and I'll pass it on to him. So a fascinating hour with, about the First War, the Second War. Uh, next week, uh, Mike Waldridge, who's one of the more distinguished uh, BBC foreign correspondents in, in Africa, in Asia, all over the world, a man who reported the release of Mandela, re, re, uh, reported for 40 years to the BBC and lives in North Oxford. He'll be talking about his career and also his ethics as well. He was a religious affairs correspondent for a while. So that'll be uh, Travels with My Conscience for Mike Woolwich. Do, do watch that, 5.30 next Wednesday. Um, or every, every one of these is recorded. You can find it on YouTube. So if you missed it, uh, uh, go and find it there. Tell your friends about it. Tell your friends about Mike Woolwich next week. And the Enter the Oxford Times the week after that, the new editor, Pete Cavan. But meanwhile, thank you very much for watching. Thank you, Liz. Thank you. <laughs>